It's time to dig in and discuss the questions on the minds of today's leaders. You are listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. This is where we get vulnerable, raw, and authentic about the stuff that really matters. Now, here is your host, Kathleen Reeson. Welcome to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Today's show is about how to work with a dominant person, how to work with a dominant person. Now, if you're here and you're listening, you fall into one of two groups. Now, when I say these two groups, I want you to think about them and say, which one do I fall into? Because I guarantee you, you are one or the other. You are either the dominant person or the person that says, oh my gosh, I can't stand these dominant people. How in the world do I coexist with them? (laughs) Think about that. You're either the dominant person or you're the one saying, how in the world do I coexist with these crazy dominant people? Now think about that. I'm going to give you a second and we get to self-identify which category are you in. You're either A, the dominant person or B, I don't like these dominant people. I don't understand why they take up room in this universe and how in the world do I coexist with them? So self-identify A or B right now. Got it. So you know which one you are. You're either A or B. So I'm speaking to both of these in this conversation today. When we talk about how to work with the dominant person, there's a few things we want to start with. Number one is, what is this dominant person? So if you picked A, we're going to define some characteristics that maybe you'll see in yourself. And if you pick B, you're going to see what it is that bothers you in this dominant person. So we'll put some labels on some things, the behaviors that perhaps are already happening and you're just didn't have the words for what was bothering you. So a dominant person is very task focused. They wanna look at the goal, okay, so they are very goal oriented, but task focused. They don't wanna talk about the process to get there. They wanna know this is where we're headed, this is what we wanna do, and here are the things we're gonna do to get there. Do not bother me in a brainstorming process. Dominant people often do not want to sit around the table for three hours thinking about potentially one day what we could be doing. Wouldn't it be great if blah, blah, blah. Like that's what what a dominant person, we don't want to sit and look at the other options. We just want to move forward. We are so focused on getting to the outcome that we say, let's go, come on. Now, the challenge with that is that that can often burn out everyone else. Dominant people are the ones that you want to go to when somebody has issues like moving. If you have a $3 million project that you want to complete, you've got a revenue gap. You've got a brand new market you want to walk into. You've got a team that is just not listening and disruptive in the workplace. You bring in a dominant person to get things done. That's who's going to make this happen. But if you bring in, so think about the communication styles that we talked about here probably about five weeks ago, six weeks ago, something like that. You can go back to the old shows and listen to them. This would be more in the controller space. We talked about promoters, controllers, supporters, and analyzers. The dominant person falls more in the controller space. But if you have someone that is in that supporter space, which is exactly opposite of that, that really focuses more on feelings and the process they are going to be shut down by a dominant person. So if you're somebody who wants to know how do you operate with a dominant person, here that when they get, the more dominant they get, the more focused, the more controlled, because dominance also can be seen as controlling, the more that that happens, the more that you shut down if you're in that supporter space. Now, remember, when we talked about communication styles, we talked about promoters. Promoters like brainstorming. They like throwing an idea on the wall and just running towards it and seeing if it'll work. I heard this referred to this morning. I'm on a conversation, and this guy is referring to a a friend of mine, a, a, a colleague that we have in common, and he says, this guy, he's a big visionary. He, these are the words that came out of his mouth. He likes to say, hey, the sky is blue. Anything's possible. Go for it. And the guy that I was talking to, he says, so I was wondering about some specific constraints around this project and who owns it. Do I own it? Does somebody else own it? And I go to this guy, our mutual friend, and I say, hey, who owns this project? 
And our mutual friend, he says, hey, the sky is blue, go for it. And what he means is, I don't know, I don't care, figure it out. That's a heavy in the promoter space. That is not a dominant person. The dominant person takes the project and says, I don't care if it's you that owns it or somebody else. I see a gap and I'm going. I see a problem and I'm going. And I don't care if it destroys other things in the way because this gets to be done and we all agreed on it and this is the most important thing. And so oftentimes when you have that dominant personality, that dominant person that you're working with, sometimes they can have blinders on. Think about a racehorse. When a racehorse is running in a race, what does a racehorse wear over the sides of their eyes? Have you ever seen that? So if you've never seen this, if you've never gone to a horse race, I encourage you to watch a video or pull up some pictures of some horse races. You can just Google this. And look at the horse's eyes. Because what happens when you're in a horse race is that your eyes They've got to be covered on the side. I don't mean that they can still see right in front of them, but they can't see on the sides. They put what's known as a blinder up around the horse. That's not the technical term. I, I do not know what the technical term of this is, but it's a blinder. And what it does is block out the sides the other horse is running. Because if the horse could see the other horses next to them, it would spook them. And then the horse may go throw off the rider, may go in a different direction, may buck, may uh, stop altogether, may veer directions. It could be very unsafe for the other horses, for the other riders, and for the rider that's on that horse. So in the race horse situation, we put these blinders on and say, okay, horse, the only place you can see is straight forward. So blinkers is what I'm hearing is, is one of the technical terms for that. It's a piece of the horse tack. Great. Okay. So we've got this technical terminology now. When we see the, in these horse races, we don't want them to see out the sides. We want them to just look forward. Well, in the, the case of a dominant person, the dominant person is very gifted at being able to move forward despite the obstacles around them, almost to the fact that they don't see them. Yes, they know they're there, but they don't let them get in their way. But oftentimes what they're not letting get in their way, maybe people, it may be something that's very important to people, projects that are very important to people. And so to others, it may seem like they don't care. They don't care about me. They don't care about the projects. They don't care about the other things that are important to me. And all they care about is this one outcome. And they want to work in a way that they get the outcome that they desire. So very task focused. We're going to do this this and this to win the race. So just like in the case of a horse race, you think about that horse and that rider, the horse has got to move one foot in front of the other. They get to the turn in the, the race and then they've got to turn the horse. The horse is moving its body in a different direction. So very mechanical. We go around the turn, around another turn and we've got four different turns and then we're coming in for the win. That's our goal. We're not concerned about the other horses. All we know is that we want to win. And so if we don't see a horse in front of us, then we're good because we're in the lead. They would be behind or beside us. We don't care about behind or beside. We only care about what's in front of us because that's our next goal. So here that dominant people are very task oriented, focused on the end result. Now the challenge with that is they can come off at, in a lot of different ways that aren't kind or loving. And so if you're not in group A, and I didn't just describe some of your traits, you're in group B, the challenge is that you can be turned off by a lot of that. That can be really challenging for you. And when that happens, we tend to shut down. We tend to pull back. We tend to not want to work on a team with a dominant person. But today's goal, the show, is about how do we work with a dominant person? Because I believe that group A and group B can come together and be a team. I believe that we can work with dominant people. I believe that dominant people can learn and be very self-aware because there is nothing better than a highly self-aware dominant person. When you're highly self-aware, unless you're a horse in a race, you can actually take those blinders off, see what's around you, shift so that you can be kind to those around you, that, that you're not spooked by the things around you, so that you can incorporate them and yet still move forward and still win the race. So that is a very cool situation that I've seen in a lot of companies. So let's put this into the words of what may be happening at your company. 
let's say that you've decided to go after a new, a new, you're going to launch a new product. And so you have put portion of your company in charge of this new product. Let's say you put a team in charge of this new product and you have one person on the team that has taken it upon themselves to be single handedly the leader of the team. Not it's like a self-appointed person. And they said, we are going to make this product happen no matter what. Now you got somebody else on the team that says, yeah, I agree with you. And we got to get the marketing material put together. And we got to have the website and the landing page. All this stuff gets to happen before we can go out and have a conversation. But the dominant person says, no, uh -uh, I just want to go have that conversation. I don't need all that stuff. Now the sales, the marketing person, what that marketing person heard was this stuff's not important which is not what the dominant person is saying. The dominant person is saying, I don't need that in order to go start the conversation. Absolutely, it's important. It's just not what I need in order to start the conversation. But the marketing person heard it as, this is not valuable. This person does not value what I bring to the table. And now I don't want to work with this person because this person could care less, just invalidated marketing. Hear how that creates the challenge in the workplace? Now, we could absolutely bring this into home life as well, because it happens all the time in family units with spouses. So remember that this underlying concept that we talk about a lot is how you show up anywhere is how you show up everywhere, which means if this is a conversation that you're having at home, it's absolutely a conversation you're having at work and vice versa. So these concepts, while I care about them in the workplace, I absolutely care about them at home, too, because you get a controller in a marriage that doesn't work either. You get a controller in a partnership and that doesn't work either because same thing. You've got one person saying, hey, this is how I'm going to go. Now, dominant people don't often stop to think about how their words are going to impact other people. It's not because they don't care. It's because they've got those blinders on that don't allow them the space to say, oh, filter. Let me think about this. How should I land this communication so that other people can hear it? No, they're focused on driving forward, very task oriented goal outcome. And so they're not worried about how do I land this communication so I don't hurt someone. There are fires popping all, all over in a dominant person's life. And so constantly putting out these fires that we're apologizing because we're holding the match. So we're going to shift this. We're going to actually talk about as a dominant person, let's understand what's really going on underneath that. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is why are some people dominant and others aren't? Why are some people dominant and others aren't? So think about that. Why would somebody develop these dominant traits? Because let's let's really be clear about this. When we pop out of the wound, so we're born like day one, we pop out, welcome to the world, here we are. It's not like we have this sticker on us that says, this person's going to be dominant, and then next door in the other room, this other baby's born, and we say, oh, but this person's not. No, this person's going to have different traits. But that doesn't happen. So we are all created based on the, these, these traits that we create are based on the scenarios in which we grow up. Now, here's something that's crazy that we can borrow from our psychology friends, that between the ages of zero and eight, we have actually created all of the different limiting beliefs that we're going to face in our life. So now as a mother of a nine, 11 and 13 year old, I realized that the reasons that my children will be in a therapist's office years from now have already been created. Now, luckily we had an experience this weekend with my 11 year old that was quite traumatic. It happened with our dog, he's fine. I, I'll go into detail about that. Maybe it's, it's kind of gross. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm just going to brush over that. You're welcome for that. Anyway, we had this traumatizing experience and I laughed and said, oh, but he's 11. It's okay. <laughs> he was under eight. We got to watch out for this. No, that's not exactly true because there still are limiting beliefs that can happen. Okay. You guys want to know the story? All right. I'll tell you real quick and then we'll go on a break. Okay. Here's the story. <laughs> My 11 year old, he's going to love that I'm telling you this. Okay. So we are on the couch. We're watching a show. My 11 year old, he's laying on a pillow on the couch. And this is a, like a white cream ish colored pillow. And our little dog, our six pound, she hops up on the couch by him and he goes, Oh, you want to lay by my head? Hold on. So he moves the cream colored pillow. The, the color is important. He moves the cream colored pillow out of the way so the dog can lay right next to his head. And all of a sudden, I'm not even sure that this happened. 
but I just looked over and I saw this look of fear on my son's face and oh gosh it was so bad the tears started and I look over and our dog she'd had some uh, gastrointestinal issues and she had actually pooped like four times right next to his face and on his hand he was mortified I mean just totally mortified and the first thing I thought of was oh my gosh I'm so glad that you moved the pillow <laughs> and then and then the very kind and loving side of me uh I came forward. But anyway, that happened. Uh, oh, and then we ran to the bathroom to, to scrub off the any sort of leftovers. And he was just mortified. He was still, his lip was trembling. I thought, oh, I'm, I can't believe this happened. And I'm so glad you're 11. But then I sent a note because I'm a loving, caring mother. I sent a note to my sisters and said, hey, by the way, in case I, I go before you, just want to let you know, Noah's going to be in a therapist's office someday. And here's the story. <laughs> so... They all laugh too, of course, but what, <laughs> what I'm saying is that all of your limiting beliefs happen between the ages of zero to eight, according to psychology, but there are certain traumatic events that can happen post eight that then also create some limiting beliefs. This might happen to be one of them. <laughs> we'll know years from now. This is our psychology experiment in the works, but I share this because some people have developed dominant traits and some people have developed triggers to those that have dominant traits. And so if you have triggers, which means you're frustrated by people that have dominant personalities, they bother you for whatever reason, it's also something that you can look at and say, why do these people bother me? Why do people that come on strong or that are so focused on big picture or are these, these task oriented, why do they bother me? Because that's as big of a challenge as actually being a dominant person can be challenging, both sides of that. Okay, that's my story and how I'm tying it in. We're going to go on a quick break and when we get back, we'll talk about uh, why. Well, we'll just continue the conversation. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. We'll continue the conversation. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reason Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. And today we're talking all about how to work with a dominant person. And just before the commercial break, before I shared the story of my 11-year-old and what happened, what I was getting into was talking about how we're all born the, the same way, with the same openness of any sort of personality traits. We develop those over time, generally between the ages of zero to eight, but they, we can certainly pick them up after that. And the thing that is so interesting is that some of us pick up these dominant traits and we pick them up not because we say, gosh, we wanna be controlling or gosh, we wanna be like the racehorse who just focuses on the goals and the tasks to get there. Like, that's not really why we pick them up. We pick them up either because of some kind of safety reason. So maybe we lived in an experience where we felt unsafe. It doesn't mean that we were actually harm was coming to us. One, one of the stories that I hear repeatedly when I talk with my friends that are psychologists and have really studied this, they say that even the, uh, the dropping off of your kindergartner. So you think about this person, this kid has been at home, maybe with mom or dad or been in a loving environment at a preschool or somewhere else. They've been in an environment where they felt safe and then they get dropped off in this weird location to them with kids that they don't know, with adults that they don't know. And then mom or dad leave. 
And so that moment for many, many adults, but really many kids is when it starts, is very traumatizing. And so they get this feeling of abandonment or lack of safety. And when that happens, then controlling can protect them. So dominance can also can often be seen as a way to protect ourselves. So sometimes when we see people that really want to be protective of their environment and focused on goals and not get focused on processes or brainstorming, oftentimes those can be seen as really aloof type spaces. Like, for example, the process of brainstorming and saying, well, what if and we just totally vision something? We're in this uncertainty. We don't know if this is what how we really want to create, but let's just go there and pretend for a while. You've got to be really solid and, and, and have the appearance of safety in order to allow your mind to go there. So you think about COVID, for example, which we all walked through. That was a really challenging time because it felt like for many people that the floor, the ceiling and the sides around them just blew apart. And so this concept of safety wasn't there. And so what what you may have seen is that controllers got a little more controlling, dominant people got a little more dominant and were saying, where can I be more dominant? Searching around them to say, what is it that I can lead control or be dominant of? And so what happened was you saw other people say, oof, I don't like that and kind of really pull away. And we saw businesses break up. We saw a lot of employees leave their environment, their companies. We saw at home divorce rates increase significantly. We've seen that just over the last few years. But what we're seeing right now in this moment is that the divorce rate is significantly higher because people made it through that period. And now finally they feel like they can take this deep breath and they're saying, I'm out. So the dominance is, is really showing itself now. It's like holding on. If you're on a roller coaster, you're holding on to the bar and you're saying, oh, okay, twist, turn up, down. Anybody else feel like that's been the last two years? Yeah, twist, turn, up, down. We finally have this moment to take a deep breath. And, and what we're finding is that people are saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to come back on top and I am going to be my dominant style. And it means I'm out. I'm going to go find something else. I'm going to focus on the outcome. Let's go. Let's move. And so we're seeing a lot of action being taken. Divorce, people leaving companies. And so that's a little bit of what's going on underneath that. When people are dominant, we get to look at why, what's really causing that. Other people, they love the outcome, the win. So are driven by a win. So where some people really enjoy the journey, you'll hear the, the words, yeah, enjoy the journey. It's just as great as the win. But some people really just love the win. And so when you're focused that way, there's no right or wrong. It's like going on a road trip and you decide to drive your car and you're going to go from one side of the country to the other. Now, I have friends that do this thing called road rally, and they'll actually, it's a different road trip, a different route every year. But the goal is they go from East Coast to West Coast or West Coast to East Coast. So a lot of them, they take these luxury, high performance cars and they put them in these trailers because you don't want to put mileage on it to get to your starting point. So you trailer it and then you take it to your starting point. And then your goal is to get from one coast of one of our in the United States. I'm speaking of specifically one coast to the other coast in the fastest amount of time going with the speed limits uh, or I don't know exactly the specific rules around that, but I think within it said within legal limits. So whatever that means to that driver, but they want to get from point A to point B, they can loosely define their course, but it's, it's pretty like, you know, the towns that you have to hit, but if there's side roads that they take, that's okay. And so they just have to check in at these certain points, of course, of, of the course of this race. So those are the, the rules. Well, there are some people that really enjoy that journey. If I'm going to go on a road trip from point A to point B, I'm either going to be the person that really enjoys the journey and says, I wonder what we can see along the way. Gosh, the biggest ball of twine is located halfway through our trip. We should totally stop and see it. Or the biggest park bench or the biggest porch swing. Let's stop and get the picture. And so there's those people. And then there are the people, mainly the ones that do this race, that say, I don't care about that stuff. The goal is to get to this destination the fastest. I don't care whether I get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and I have to go to bed at 3.59 the night before and I get one minute of sleep. If it means that I get to my destination the fastest I'm in, let's go. 
And so that's their, that's, that's somebody who's got more of a dominant personality and you can tell them all you want, enjoy the journey, but the journey isn't what drives them. What drives them is the destination. That's the win for them. And so their goal, their task oriented is how do I get to the destination? So you can sit there all day long and, and attempt to convince them to enjoy the journey, but that's not their come from. That's not their drive. And so what we get to realize is if we are not in the camp of saying, I want to get to the destination and that's what I'm so excited about, we're in the camp of enjoying the journey. We're one or the other. Enjoy the journey or enjoy the destination. Now think about which one you are. You could absolutely be saying, but I love the journey and I love the destination. Yes, absolutely. And which one of it drives you? Are you the person that if you had the choice between a road trip or a plane ride, if there's a direct flight, even better, would you pick the plane ride because you want to get there the fastest or would you pick the car because you want to experience along the way? Now, a dominant person, they might be on that road rally because they're going to get there fast and that's how they're going to be rewarded. They want to be in a competition because we love competition. But if you're, or maybe you're picking the plane ride entirely, you're not even on this competition because why would you spend 60 hours going from coast to coast when you could hop on a plane and be there in eight. So think about that. The challenge comes in when you're somebody that wants to drive your car and stop at the biggest ball of twine and you're sitting in the passenger seat, but the person in the driver's seat just wants to get to the destination. See that conflict. Put this in the terms of work. The problem comes in when you're the person that wants to have everything lined up, you want to have the marketing materials in place, the landing page, the website looks perfect, the copy has been tested and proven, but the person next to you, they just want to go sell it. They just want to go start having conversations. Put them in that role. That's what they're saying. So one of the, the first steps is really understanding what's the come from of that person. What is it that's really important to them? So if I'm the person that's in the passenger seat, let's say, and I, let's take this on the, let's continue down the conversation of driving. Okay, so let's just say I live in Iowa and my husband who, let's just say he's a very dominant person for sake of conversation, and I am not for sake of conversation, and we're gonna go to California. Actually, no, I'm gonna put this into a real life scenario for you. We're going to go to Phoenix here on vacation in a couple of weeks. There was conversations around, do we fly or do we drive? Now, I'm gonna, so forget everything that I just said, because I'm going to give you a real life scenario here. Okay, so at my house, we're deciding, do we go to Phoenix? Yes. How do we get to Phoenix? Do we drive there or do we fly? Now, my kids, they say, we should drive, mom. Think about all the different places we could stop and see. My husband's in the, well, that would be fun to drive. Yeah, we could do that. I'm in the camp of, let's fly. There's a three hour direct flight that I can hop on and be there. And with the time change, it's really only about an hour because Phoenix is two hours behind from a time zone perspective where we are here. So an hour of time technically elapses between where we're at and where we're going. So that's our time lapse, an hour, but we're in the flight, we're in the air for like three hours, that's it. And then once we get there, we can rent a car and we can go wherever we want. But why would we, why would we spend 24 hours in the car versus three hours? Now my kids who have Googled the stuff between Des Moines and Phoenix, they know the different places that we could stop. What about this? What about this? What about this? My kids really want to enjoy the journey. My husband's like, whatever you guys want to do, that's fine. And I'm saying, let's go. Come on. We're going to have fun when we get there. The journey is the end point when we get there, the experience. Now, that is a perfect example of the dominant person. In that scenario, who's the dominant person? Me. <laughs> I am acting as the dominant person there because I'm saying, come on, let's go. I am focused on the goal of getting there. While my kids are focused on the journey. Yeah, they want to go on an adventure. They're looking at the start of the vacation to be when we leave the house. I'm looking at the start of the vacation to be 
when we get there. So how do we make a decision and how do we move forward? Understanding our come from. So my kids could say, but mom, uh, it's really important to me to see these things that I've never seen. I've never been to this place and this place and wouldn't it be great for me to see it? And now as a dominant person, I get to make a choice. I can either support what they're saying or I can charge forward. And even if I really want to charge forward, I get to take those blinders off and say, wow, you know what? They really haven't been there. And would that be something that would be important? Now, that's the piece that we talk about a really self-aware dominant person. Those are the questions that they're saying. Well, where's their, the other person's come from? Well, why would they think the way that they think? Would I be willing to change? Would I be willing to slow down? Would I be willing to support their vision even when it's in conflict with mine? Because will we get to the same outcome? Remember, dominant person's outcome, our goal is to get to Phoenix. So could I be okay with their idea? Could I be okay, even though it's slower, even though it's going to take 21 more hours, could I be okay with their solution or do I enroll them in mine? Now, oftentimes dominant people aren't going to take the time to enroll somebody, which means sell them your idea. Tell them about why this could be great and get their buy-in. Oftentimes, dominant people shift, they they skip over that step. But that's the piece when we're self-aware dominant person, we are working to get to a middle ground where everyone can be happy. That's the step that's most often missed. We're going to go on a quick break. And when we get back, we've got all kinds of more information on how to work with a dominant person. You'll see to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Talk to you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on The Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows, along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. We've been talking today all about how to work with a dominant person. So I shared with you the story about our family vacation, and I'm actually gonna share with you the end of that. So what are we doing? How are we getting to Phoenix? And the reason that I'm gonna share this with you is because it did take a little bit of work on my part as the one who wanted to fly. (laughs) And uh, what I did was I talked with, my my husband was really, he could have cared less. He was fine either way. But I talked with the kids and I said, hey, with our timing that we had, we had, We could miss Easter. If we missed Easter at home, we'd still celebrate Easter, but we wouldn't celebrate at home the way that we normally do. And if we chose to do that, we'd actually have two more days of vacation and we could extend our trip on the other side. So right now we're leaving on a Sunday night. So of Easter and we're coming back that Saturday. So, well, we could leave on Saturday or even Friday night and then come back on Sunday. And if you want to drive, that would give us time on either side to be able to drive. And it would mean that we would not have Easter at home. And that was something that's really important to them, more so because they get to see their grandparents. And so they have a good time and their their other arts and family. And so that's something that's really important to them. I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? So I, I had my own ideas and thoughts on this, on how I wanted this to look for our family. But I got to honor that theirs would be different. And for some people, you might say, well, they're kids. They're going to go along with whatever. Yes, they are. But also, my kids are 9, 11, 13. 
And as they start to age, especially in that preteen teenage years, they really start to form their own opinions. And so they, they can get a little frustrated if their voice isn't heard, just like in the workplace. You know, if people's voices aren't heard, then they get frustrated and feel like they aren't valued. And then we know that when somebody's not valued, that's why they choose to leave. So I get to value their opinions and at least hear them. I said, okay, so if you want to drive, it's, it's two days worth of driving one way. So four days total. So even if we left on Saturday and you guys were okay being gone for that long, that means Saturday and Sunday, we'd be driving. You'd be there Monday through Friday, and then we'd be gone Saturday and Sunday. But in order to make that all happen, you're going to miss Easter at home. And they said, well, no, it's really important for us to have Easter here. I said, okay, well, if that's the case, then we're going to drive Monday, Tuesday, and we'll come back Saturday, Sunday. So you're really only going to have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in Phoenix. So you'll have three days. Now they wanted to see the Grand Canyon while we're there, which is you know, about four hours north of Phoenix. So, so if you want to spend a day up at the Grand Canyon, getting there, exploring the Grand Canyon and getting back, that is a full day. So that's one of your days. So you really only have two days in Phoenix. And they said, well, we really want to get a house with a pool and just be able to relax. And, and they want to do horseback riding one day. They've got this ranch that they want to go to. We went out to Phoenix a few years ago and they really liked it. They want to go back. And so they want to do that for half a day. So, and then in the morning, they just want to hang out by the pool. Well, that really only gives them one day to just relax by this pool. And when they looked at it, they said, oh, that's not much time. So, well, what would it look like if we flew? I said, well, flights, if we, if we spent Easter here, but we left on Easter night and that night, we could actually fly out in later in the afternoon, which is about $1,500 for five of us, super cheap flights. Or we could go out on Monday, except it's $2,000 more to fly on Monday. So I said, oh, well, that's quite a big price difference. We could just leave Sunday night. I said, okay. So if we did that, then how would that work? And so we explained the time difference to them and how we could leave here around five and actually get into Phoenix around six. And then we could go up to Flagstaff. So fly into Phoenix, drive up to Flagstaff, which is a couple hours, spend the night in Flagstaff, go to the Grand Canyon the next day, and then we could come back to Phoenix. So that would be our Monday. And then you would have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in Phoenix. And on Saturday, we could fly home, which would give four full days in Phoenix. And if you want to do your horseback riding, that experience for a half a day, that still gives you three full days to just hang out and relax by the pool. And so when they looked at that, said, okay, so, so alternative A, we drive, we leave before Easter, we spend four days in the car and you get to see all those experiences that you were talking about. And we have limited time to actually be in Phoenix. Or the flip side of that is we fly, we get to do the Grand Canyon and you have more time there. So what do you wanna do? And it didn't mean that based on their decision that we absolutely had to do that, but it was just bringing them along and enrolling them in the thought that if the goal, the outcome, remember, dominant people are focused on outcome. If the outcome is to maximize our amount of time that we're spending relaxing in the sun in Phoenix, then it seemed like flying would provide the best outcome. Now, if their goal is to just enjoy the journey and we're not, we don't have a shared outcome, then we're never going to get to the same place. So we got to ensure in the beginning, so as the dominant person that really wanted to fly, because it would give us the most time, I realized that I got to actually break that down with them and say, all right, so what is it that you want out of this vacation? What I want is the most amount of relaxation time that we possibly can have in Phoenix. Is that what you want? So shared vision. Do we have a shared vision? That was our first piece. And then when we both agreed on that, when the kids said this and I said this as well, again, my husband could have cared less. So he was in the conversation, but he wasn't really one way or the other. He was fine with either way. So then we went down to, well, here, if you choose your choice, here are the consequences for that. And we often think of consequences as like bad things. It's not that. It's just if we choose this, here's, here's the outcome. So if we choose to drive, it would mean that we would not have Easter at home. Is having Easter at home important to you? They all decided yes. So when they went to that point, it really constricted the amount of time that we could drive. And so then they got to be an easy yes for flying. So now I share this with you because this, again, the principle of how we show up anywhere is how we show up everywhere. 
This is the exact same conversation that you could apply to a workplace challenge. Let's go back to that situation we were talking about where we're launching a new product and the salesperson just wants to go out and sell it. But the marketing person says, no, we've got to create the landing page and the brochure and have all of the information and the copy tested so that by the time you go out, you have everything that you need. It's not that the marketing person doesn't want the salesperson to sell. They actually all have the common vision to sell this. It's just that the marketing person is okay being slower up front, knowing that they can catch up on the back end. And the salesperson wants to be faster up front, knowing that they'll work it out on the back end. So they want to move on the front end where the marketing person wants to move on the back end. So that's the misalignment is only right there. They can agree on the same vision. We want to get this market share. What they don't agree on is the urgency to which the sale has to happen. What they don't agree on is the urgency to which they communicate with this prospect. The marketing says, let's get this figured out first. Let's test it. The sale says, I'll go out there and figure out what it needs to say and I'll let you know. That's the, dis the difference. And so what would happen if the salesperson sat down with the marketing person and said, I understand your challenge. What is underneath your desire to test and play with this and have it look really great before I go out and talk to people about this? And the marketing person may say, well, I'm not really sure if this is the market that we even want to go into. Maybe we want to point in a different direction. And the salesperson says, well, would it be supportive to you if I go out and have a couple conversations and I bring that information back to you? I'm not going to necessarily offer anything at this point, but what I will do is gather the information that you require in order for you to move forward. Would that work for you? And perhaps the marketing person then says, oh, yeah, you know what? That would be beneficial. Could you make sure you ask about this and this and this? And now all of a sudden the marketing salespeople can work together. The salesperson can still go out and have that conversation. And the marketing person can say, oh, okay, they're getting the information for me so that I can create what I want to create. And in the meantime, maybe I'm doing some work or maybe it's just on hold until I get that information from the salesperson. They can be a part of the research instead of me working with my team to do the research so that I can hand it to the salesperson to go use it. How can we leverage that salesperson to be a part of our research team? And so when we see this as the dominant person really has a come from that's very different than our own come from, if we are not the dominant person, then we can work together. Now, oftentimes, if we are not the dominant person, we are triggered by the dominant person, which means we experience anger, frustration, shut down, whatever that is for you. When somebody, when you feel like you're being controlled, what happens? So answer that question for yourself. And even if you're a dominant person, answer this question for yourself. When I feel like I'm being controlled, I what? I get angry, I get frustrated, I get mad, I get shut down. So think about that. When This is speaking for me, from my perspective. When I feel like I'm being controlled, I get very frustrated. I get very frustrated. Now, the thing is, that's not about the other person. Dominant personalities, what, what the people that are, have dominant personalities, what they really want you to know is that their dominant personality has nothing to do with you. It is not personal. It is a way that they have created a style in their life that works for them, but it doesn't mean that it always works for you. And so what happens and what I see all the time and when my clients call me up and we're walking through situations in their workplace, they are saying, they are saying things like, well, this person attacked me or this person attacked this person or it's, it's taken as personal conflict. And the reality is somebody else's dominant personality is not personal. How anybody else shows up is not personal. It's about them, not about us. And so what we get to look at is when you get frustrated based on how somebody else shows up, that's about you, not about them. I control my own emotion related to how someone else shows up. But workplace conflict exists because we add our own emotion based on somebody, how somebody else is showing up. Now, I think the best place to see this, I've said I've got a 9, 11, and 13-year-old. My 13-year-old's in seventh grade, which I believe is one of the hardest years you couldn't pay me to go back to my seventh grade year in middle school. And my son is, is in the middle of it. And the biggest challenge is that there's a lot of 
personification going on, which means he said, she said, this happened and I made this, I made it mean this about me. There's a lot of people taking things personally. And so one of the things that we have taught my seventh grader and what we continue to have these conversations on is that how somebody acts or shows up is about their experiences up until then. It has nothing to do with us. We are just a mere existence in their story. But when we make it mean something about us, that's when we create challenges. So when somebody's showing up controlling or dominant, they're not attempting to control or dominate us. They're attempting to control or dominate a situation. And when we can see that, when we can separate what that somebody's showing up as controlling or dominating of a situation, not of us, then we can look at this differently and we can say, okay, so that's their approach to it. Here's my approach. How do we work together? How do we create a win-win on both sides? How do we create a win for them and a win for me? How does this work? And when we shift our thinking to that process, that's when we can move forward. This is really powerful stuff. It works at home. It works at the office place. But oftentimes when I have my clients call me up, this is what they say to me. We have these conversations because people call me up. I work with a lot of executives who really, they don't have anybody to kick around ideas with. They don't have anybody. They see these challenges that are happening and they just need another sounding board to figure out how to move forward. And at the end of our conversations, they say, I'm not even exactly sure what we did, but wow, I feel better and I know exactly where I get to go. Because here's the principle. I don't have the answer, but you know who does? You. And when we can peel back that this is not, it's not personal. When we can peel back that layer, we can really get to the core and say, this is where we can figure out a situation where we can work together. Because when you do that, that's really how you create powerful teams, powerful relationships, powerful families. And right, we're going to go on a quick break. When we get back, we're going to wrap all of this up. We are listening, you are listening to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. Talk to you in just a second. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. We've been talking all today about how to work with a dominant person. We've covered a lot in this show, but what I want you to really know is that somebody, whether you're the dominant person or you're the person that is working with the dominant person or attempting to work or maybe not working with the dominant person, but you're in a relationship with somebody that's a dominant person, that how we've shown up to date, so our dominant style, it's not really about us. It's about something that we are we are attempting to create in our life. Maybe it's the perception of safety. Maybe it's the perception of the win that comes at the end. But a dominant person tends to focus on outcomes and is very task focused, where people that aren't dominant don't. And so the key is that we can figure out a way to work together. So for the dominant people, for the dominant person, you get to understand where the other person's coming from and meet them where they are. You get to ask questions and be curious and figure out what is it that they want. And if you're not the dominant person, you get to have that same type of conversation with the dominant person, ask questions, be curious, and see how they could fit into a structure that is different than what they view. Dominant people thrive when they believe that they're safe. So if you are not a dominant person, you're frustrated by the dominant people in your life, think about how can you create an environment where they feel really safe and be curious about what that would feel like for them. Because a big trap that we can get into is creating an environment that feels safe for us, but it doesn't feel safe for them. So we can't project our beliefs of what safety looks like onto them. We get to be curious about what safety looks like for them. I have a friend who know in her relationships, both at work and at home, so her, she's in an employer-employee relationship. She's the employee with her boss. She has given them permission. She has two bosses. 
She's given them permission to say to her when she gets uptight or appears dominant, she said, please say to me, hey, remember, you're safe here. You're safe. Now, safety for her means a lot of different things, none of which we could ever truly understand. But for her, those words calm her. I can tell you personally, for me, when I get into a dominant space, you could ask my husband, you could ask my colleagues, the people that I work with a lot. When I get dominant, when I get stressed is when I feel like my world is spinning out of control. So unless I am very grounded in what I want, what I want to create, it feels like my world is spinning out of control. I don't like that feeling. And so what I'm going to do is grasp at whatever I can, control whatever I can. And so I have instructed the people around me to remind me that it's okay. It's going to be okay. My husband says those. My colleagues say that. It's okay, Kathleen. It's okay. And I might fight back. I might say, it's not okay. But what it's really doing is reminding me that it is okay. I am okay. The world is okay. And so we get to look at what does safety look like for that person, not for us. Because if you want to cool down a dominant person, understand what that means. We could spend so much more time on the show, but I want to highlight what's up for next week. Next week, this is something that I've seen happening a lot. And it doesn't matter if it's small companies, medium-sized companies, big companies. We've talked a ton about emotional intelligence. And I'm going to shift the focus for just a little bit for this show. Because really, this the Kathleen recent show is about conversations that executives are having. So here's one of the things that I see a lot. I see companies going to market, speaking from a very solutions-based mindset. So we talk about this aspirational, like what my product or service is going to do for you. But people buy in a very pain-based space. And we don't want to be in a pain-based space. It can often be very challenging to speak from a pain-based place. It's uncomfortable. And especially as your, your salespeople, especially if we, if we keep in line with this dominant space, we don't want to go from a pain-based space because it doesn't feel safe. But where we're going to go is to talk about how do you hold the pain-based space for someone else so that they can really experience what's in their way and enroll them or sell them into your service or your product from that space. So I see this, I've been studying ad copy for so long in my life as I used to run an advertising agency. And I see this in ad copy. I see it in so many different places where we're selling aspirational solution base and it doesn't work. People buy to get out of pain. They do not buy to get into pleasure. So that's what we're talking about next week. I'm super excited for that show. It's going to be a lot of fun. But I thank you guys so much for listening here. If you ever have any ideas or topics that you want to hear about on the Kathleen Reeson show, <coughs> excuse me, just let me know. You can send me a note at Kathleen at KathleenReeson.com. Also, if you are an executive and you're saying, oh, gosh, it'd be nice to have that sounding board or, or someone that I can kick around some different ideas with. I have run seven different businesses in multiple industries. I've coached and consulted with thousands of different executives and entrepreneurs. And where I serve today is I speak, coach, and facilitate on topics that executives struggle with. So I'm the person that answers the phone when you call and we talk through some of these challenges. Again, like I said earlier, my clients at the end, they say, I don't know exactly what we did during that time period, but wow, do I feel better. And I know exactly where I get to go. And so that's that's a really cool place to play. That's a really big service to be offering for people to have that available to them. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. But remember today, if you leave with one thing, what I want you to know is that you either are the dominant person or you're the person that lives, works, and plays around dominant people. And if you really want to move forward with the dominant person, make sure you understand where they're at, that it's not personal, that the come from for that dominant person might be very different from where you're at, but you get to be curious and ask those questions and understand what that is. Because when you understand where they come from, then you can work together. So thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate you coming in here every Monday and spending some time with me. Have a great week. See you next week. Thank you for listening to The Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. Kathleen Reeson will return next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com.
Have a great week.